that with 5G, we have a expansion of wireless networks, which is unprecedented. With 800,000 new sites uh, being recommended in the United States alone, according to the FCC, billions of new devices that will all be interconnected. And what industry is saying is that we have to have cell towers, which they call small cells, which are shorter cell towers with not as many antennas, but still transmitting antennas closer to people than ever before in neighborhoods. Uh, here's one right in front of a house. Here's another one in my town in, uh, in Maryland, where I live. It's a new small cell right in front of the council building. And here we have an apartment building, and this is a cell tower. And of course, the people in the you know, who are living here don't know what that is. That is not a mushroom. That is a, a cell tower, a large cell tower with a lot of antennas on it, actually. We've been working on this at Environmental Health Trust. Um, I, I got involved only a decade ago, but uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, who's president, has been involved many years prior. And there are many scientists and experts who have been working for decades on this issue of wireless radiation and as well other forms of non-ionizing radiation. But now things are really happening as people wake up. And just to give you um, some overview. So Greenpeace France released a position on 5G because of the digital pollution, because of the increased carbon emissions, e-waste, uh, that conflict mineral that is stripping the earth of natural resources and contributing to human tragedies on a global scale. Now they're referring to something that I wanna bring up at the front, which is all of these devices, all of these new cell towers, all of these new interconnected things have uh, the electronics in them that are of course, uh, have they're not sustainable putting the radiation aside. They're not sustainable because of their embodied energy, the energy to mine them and um, the workers. As well, the Green Party of uh, California called on federal, state, and local officials to apply the precautionary principle for 5G. And they talk about not only the wireless radiation, but also the impact in terms of energy consumption and impact to trees um, and just this lack of environmental review for what is being proposed. In our town, and I live in Maryland, right near Washington, DC, and in Washington, DC, the companies just brought in so quickly new rules for how all of these small cells would be situated, you know, in our, right near the monument, like in all the places when you think of Washington, DC and actually the whole city. And when they did, the Sierra Club of Washington, DC came and testified on the impact to the trees, which I'm gonna talk about more. And um, there are a lot of environmental there have been protests in France around this on 5G and the energy consumption. And so I'm really um, thankful that so much awareness is happening worldwide. But if, if you really want to look at the wireless radiation and impacts to birds, bees, trees, and wildlife, there was just an incredible three-part published paper uh, by three experts in the United States Dr. Henry Lai, who's been working on this for several decades, and Albert Manville, who's former U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service lead biologist, working on the impact of communications towers on birds, now retired. And he was at Johns Hopkins, actually. I think he's still a professor emer emeritus there. Uh, and Blake Levitt, who is a journalist who's worked on this forever and has some great books on electromagnetic radiation, which you can read. Blake Levitt is her name again. And they did a review and the, it's three parts. So the first is how the levels of wireless radiation are rising and have risen so much over the last few decades. And now we're at a new place where it's going to of course exp exponentially rise because of all of these new wireless networks which are increasing the ambient levels. And they document in part two, the biological effects that are seen across all species and at what they call vanishingly low frequencies, intensities, at very low levels of exposure compared to our 
limits that we have, which are allowable. In the United States, we have limits for wireless radiation that were set in 1996, and they never considered what would be the impact to a tree or uh, birds or bees, um, fish, or they just, it was just for humans. And the levels that they set are not protective of humans. They only protect against heating, overheating, because it's the same kind of, of radiation as comes out of your microwave and you wouldn't want to heat your head. So the limits are set for heating, but not for these low, you know, long-term exposure at low levels and people who are uniquely sensitive, or we're all sensitive really to, to these frequencies. Many of us just don't have those acute, immediate uh, symptoms, but there are impacts at the cellular level uh, that have been found in many studies. And that's why there are hundreds of scientists who are calling to halt 5G and to reduce exposure. So this isn't just the Environmental Health Trust. Um, and I'm glad to send a link to that or share, you can send that to everyone. So they have links to this research, which they can refer to. It's I've been reading it. I mean, it's hundreds of pages, but they're synthesizing all of the science and calling for, oh, the part three is calling for urgent regulatory action to protect wildlife because we don't have limits that were ever set to protect them. And of course, they're going to be closer than, um, you know, you look at, you think of the birds that are going to perch on the antennas. And they also are calling for air to be habitat and for there to be regulations that apply. They document broad wildlife effects, um, orientation, migration, food finding, reproduction, mating, nest and den building, territorial maintenance and defense, longevity and survivorship. And they also talk about the genotoxic effect, effects that have been observed. Dr. Henry Lai, who's co-author, also just published a review on the DNA damage and genotoxic effects. Um, and the United States government just published in, 2000, in 2020, uh, in addition to their study showing clear evidence of cancer in animals, they also published uh, in this large animal study, the findings of DNA damage in animals exposed to just a few months of wireless radiation. And just to show you what it, we might be talking about, here's a pole, you know, with an antenna on top. And sometimes you'll have the antennas down here, depending on where they mount them. This is what we have going up in our community. Um, and this, actually I think this is from Florida. And here's a small cell. So it's a pole that's put up separately with it right on top. We have one right outside of the hotel here. In fact, I'm going to skip over this, but they have in the three-part paper, there are tables of all of these studies so that you can look at them if you want to learn more. Um, this, this picture was part of a presentation by Orange, which is actually a cell phone company, but I can't believe, well, I can, that we are not considering the impacts to birds, bees, and trees when we are rolling this out. And there's been no environmental review for the 5G network. There really should have been. And we talk about that in our lawsuit that, and, and now we are actually asking the FCC and asking our federal agencies to do a full environmental review. Because of course, you know, when, when you look at this with the birds and the, and the nests that they have here on the tower and it's a little bit warm, because the antennas give off microwave radiation. When companies come and test to see, you know, is this safe or they apply to put an antenna or a tower up, they always look to the people on the ground where people are located and take measurements and no one is measuring right up here near the antennas. Now, when they simulate that, it is just a fact that the the levels exceed FCC limits, our US government limits. So this is really like a, a place, uh, such a lack of accountability because these animals are being exposed to levels that humans aren't allowed to be exposed to. And we never even developed uh, levels to protect animals. Looking at trees, 
There's research on impacts to trees. Um, this study in particular on, uh, on radio frequency radiation impact, impacts looked as a field study that looked at many different trees, dozens of trees over nine years uh, in two cities. They measured the radiation on one side of the tree and on the other side of the tree and also documented where the antennas were and found that over time, over many years, you would see the trees, damage to the trees on the side that had the most radiation and of course uh, the antenna in line of sight. And if we're gonna have a 5G where there's gonna be all of these new small cells close to where we live, you know, in our communities where there are trees, this is just one of many critical issues that has been overlooked in the, in the, uh, the 5G rollout. And here you can see the, the tree thinning. And that study is radio frequency radiation and just trees around mobile phone base stations and science of the total environment. And there's actually an observation guide that goes along with this they, where they have all of the pictures from the study um, as a companion that you can see. And here's examples of trees over time where they took pictures. This is in 213, this is in 215. And the antenna of course was over here. And then another where they have the antenna and they show the tree and the foliage. And, but there are several court rulings worldwide that have confirmed, especially in other countries, that internet connections are more valued than trees, where they're actually trimming trees to make way for uh, the, be it, you know, the, the satellite communication or a neighbor. There's one, one court ruling where there were two neighbors and one neighbor actually got the right through a court case to cut down the other neighbor's tree because it was blocking um, the connection that they had. And of course, we recommend that there be broadband, you know, wired connections so everyone can have fast internet. It shouldn't be that people don't have access. We all need to have access to the internet and to technology, but it doesn't have to all be wireless all the time. And there are safe ways to have a infrastructure that isn't putting all of these antennas everywhere. And here are just some more pictures. This is from my town and here we have three story and that is an antenna right there. And there's um, someone's window. They sent us this picture and of course an antenna right near a bedroom window, which is what's happening all over the United States. So bees, uh, Published research has found reduced motor activity, um, biochemical changes, uh, a, a signal, a stress signal, bees putting out a stress signal when they're exposed to wireless radiation, the worker piping signal, and um, a decline in colony strength, impact to the queen egg laying rate. And there have been several published studies about this in 220, Alfonso Balmori put forward uh, research and he's done several reviews of wildlife as well as several published papers on bees. And one of the ones I just wanted to highlight where he talks about electromagnetic radiation as an emerging driver factor for the decline of insects. There's also a review by um, Alan Hill that looked at a lot of published research uh, over the last few years. And I was shocked really when I first learned about this to to see how much research that had been done. And in fact, in India, when they started looking at this issue, they, the, there was an interministerial report done by the wildlife authorities and authorities in the, of the environment. And after looking at the impacts to birds, bees and trees, they actually tightened their exposure limits from cell antennas to a 10th of what it was before because of all of the research. And actually in, we had a Indian government scientist come and give a talk a few years ago at George Washington University, sharing some of the research from India um, because of course agriculture, you know, that depended on it. And that's been um, an important area where they've been doing a lot of research. In the United States, we don't have a lot going on in the way of research on this at all. And that is something that has to change, but, uh, in fact, the companies are not 
funding research on impacts to wildlife that we know of, certainly, and U.S. government uh, a, the U.S. government is, is not. The EPA was defunded in 1996 from working on this issue. And what I'm showing here is a study that was done looking at the higher frequencies to be used in 5G. So 5G is going to use all the frequencies we have now and actually some lower frequencies we sort of haven't been using commercially and as well higher frequencies which have never been used commercially before. Now, what this study did is take five insects, and it was the first one done of its kind, and simulated if we look at how the body of the bee absorbs the higher frequencies, you know, what will we see? How much will it absorb? Because when scientists look at impacts to the environment, there's, you know, what are the levels? And then there's how much is exposed into the body? And then there's what are the effects that that we find depending on what they, they study, of course. So, um, so this was just looking at the absorption. And what they found is that as the frequencies got higher, the body of the animal, of the insects absorbed the, uh, the wireless radiation more intensely to where there was resonance with the animal. So as the, the wave matched the size of the insect, it was at its highest amount. And they conclude this could lead to changes to insect behavior, physiology, and morphology over time. Now, these scientists actually went on to do two other studies, which I'm not going to talk about, but one was on the life cycle of the honeybee. They looked at the larva and all the different, um, different stages of the bee and how they would absorb the radiation. And then they just did a study on mosquitoes, which of course all found the same thing which is that as the frequency gets higher, there's more intense absorption. And of course the US government hasn't thought of this at all in their policy making, of which there is no policy making on impacts to wildlife. And Dr. Albert Manville, who I talked about, where you can go to our website at ehtrust.org and download all of this and read all of it and see a lot of citations, but he has uh, written book chapters and also sent information to the FCC calling for protections for birds and wildlife. He talks about studies that have, as I've talked about with bees, where there's been impacts to reproduction and in different birds. And um, he's just done an incredible amount of work on this, the chapter that I talked about before as well. So when companies start to put these up and they often get laws passed that allow them to fast track them without people having notice or hearing or hearings. Something that comes up is also the pruning. Who is in charge of making sure that the root system is not impacted? Who's monitoring? Where is the oversight on the tree trimming? And what do you do when your tree is harmed in, in your community? And this is coming up in, in our community pretty intensely actually. And as you know, trees are critical to climate protection. So we have the impact from the radiation and also, of course, the impact from the pruning and from the root disturbance as well. And trees are critical to, to climate, reducing temperature and so forth. I know everyone is aware of this. So um, just to tell you what's happening around the world, this is a, a PSA from French Polynesia where they, have an educational campaign on reducing exposure. And this is a little short 30 minute video. They show all the things that emit radiation. They explain how to protect yourself from the radiation. This is Cyprus where they have full scale bus ads on reducing exposure to children. So I have here the bus and this is the translated one. Don't irradiate me, learn how to protect me. They've also removed Wi-Fi from um, the Archbishop Macarius Hospital neonatal units. There's a lot happening in terms of kids. The American Academy of Pediatric is calling for um, updating our outdated limits because children absorb more radiation compared to adults because they are they have smaller heads, thinner skulls, more liquid on their skull, and they're in their more liquid in their brain tissue. I'm sorry, and 
they absorb proportionally more into their brain of wireless radiation. In addition, they have, of course, more sensitive brains. And there's research that has shown damage to memory, increased hyperactivity, damage to brain cells. This is a study um, from Turkey where they've, this animal study, where they've looked at the impact of brain cells. And actually this study was on the FCC record and ignored by the FCC. And um, there's a lot you can do to protect yourself from and reduce your exposure from your phone, like keeping it away from your head and body, using a speakerphone, not carrying it in your pocket. Um, and I can talk about that if you have questions, but what we can't do when a cell tower goes up in front of our bedroom or in front of our house is protect ourselves from that too easily. There's some shielding, but there's challenges with shielding and it's involuntary exposure. And this is, um, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. So what a lot of people ask is, well, don't we have rules or protections and what are they? And uh, as I talked about in 1996, wireless radiation limits were set by the FCC after the EPA was defunded. And in 2008 and 2009, those are the last time we had congressional hearings. And of course, none of that centered on wildlife because that has just been lost. I mean, we've been talking about human health, which is important, but the animals haven't been discussed. And then in 2019, the FCC said, you know, after looking at years of an inquiry, which is where they asked for information and for science, scientists to respond for members of the public, what did they think of these 1996 limits? The FCC determined that those limits were fine and we should just keep the 1996 limits. And that was when we filed against the FCC along with uh, Children's Health Defense and there was actually 14 petitioners in the case. Our case was consolidated with um, CHD and the other uh, petitioners. And in August of this year, the ruling was in our favor. And what we argued was that the FCC has ignored thousands, uh, over 10,000 pages of evidence that were submitted where scientists were saying, these limits that you have are not protective. And the court found that the FCC had acted, uh, their decision was arbitrary and capricious in keeping those, saying the 1996 limits did not need to be changed. And they ordered the FCC to properly examine non-cancer harms, such as impacts from long-term exposure, children's vulnerability. Um, they talked about how the testimony of people who'd been injured uh, had been ignored. They need to address impacts to the developing brain and reproductive system. And they said the FCC had completely failed to address environmental effects and that they needed to relook at what was on their record and do another determination based on the record. The EPA did not file any opinion as to whether the 1996 limits were adequate or protective at, at all. Uh, just They just put a one paragraph statement as actually did the National Cancer Institute and uh, the National Toxicology Program, just saying, we're glad that you're doing this. But they didn't issue an opinion. In fact, there's been no opinion put forward by any uh, US health or safety agency that's looked at the totality of the evidence. The FDA did put forward a opinion, which I'm not going to talk in detail about here, except to say that's not that wasn't the totality of the science, and they certainly didn't look at environmental effects. The FDA has decided that the study that they asked for uh, was not applicable to humans, and that's a whole long story, which I can talk to another time or if you if you have a question about it. The New Hampshire Commission on 5G, which I also recommend as a resource, put forward 15 recommendations after looking at 5G health and the environment for over a year. They interviewed many experts. They had a commission that had scientists, elected officials, um, members of industry, and they determined that there needed to be an assessment of the environmental impacts 
a full review of the scientific research, development of science-based safety limits for humans and as well as a wildlife, a multimedia national public awareness educational campaign that wireless radiation should be reduced in schools and libraries by replacing Wi-Fi with wire technology and that there be setbacks from, for cell towers and homes to increase the distance rather than make that distance uh, closer. And this is just an example of some of the resources we have. We have like, this is worldwide policy on 5G and cell towers. And we talk about what communities are doing what, um, because like in France, 60 mayors and elected officials called to halt 5G in many different cities. There's been action on that in Switzerland. They didn't change their wireless exposure limits after doing a full review of this issue. And they have much more stringent limits uh, as India does compared to the United States. So I also recommend this um, in the Society of Environmental Journalists, Katie Alvord did a piece about wireless technology as an environmental health risk. In addition, uh, the University of Washington has an article, what will 5G mean for the environment? Talking about some of these issues and hopping into the impact of climate. All of these new devices, as well as the new kinds of antenna systems that are gonna be used in 5G will increase energy consumption and contribute to climate change. And where I get most of my information on this I have here a slide from the University of Washington, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about our website, which has a lot of this resource, is from industry itself. Because the wireless industry, they don't wanna pay a lot of money and they're having to figure out how are they gonna pay for the increased electric bill? In fact, there's entire white papers by industry about how are they gonna pay for all the energy it will take. And what they're doing for the 5G antennas like in China, is they turn off the uh, 5G so that it's not uh, when it's at nighttime, when it's not in use as much so that they can conserve energy. There is no way, even with the energy efficiency, which industry is really working on, there's no way that it can uh, handle the massive amount of new devices. And that's, it's just gonna outstrip. We're gonna have more devices, cheaper devices, and they all plug in. You, you know, you, you um, just like I have my computer plugged in, they all use energy and there's more devices, it's gonna be more energy consumption. And in this article uh, by the University of Washington by Claire Coran, which is also a, a really good article, it talks about the, the increase in uh, energy usage because of the more devices as well as the technology itself. The new antenna systems uh, beam forming and, and they, uh, they can have a high, it's been termed an energy hog. They use more energy. Actually, that's my next slide. And IEEE Spectrum has an article on that. In France, the, the, um, uh, it's the Council on Climate has put forward a report on 5G as well. Uh, cautioning. And what, um, what studies show is that wired connections have the lowest energy use compared to wireless connections. 